Aditya Intervention Agarwal, like so few poker pros out there, has had the benefit of being mentored by one of the greatest poker players out there, Sorel Imperium Mitzi. The 23-year-old from Calcutta, India, has used that advantage, along with his keen ability to finish off tournaments, to rake in hundreds of thousands of dollars online and tens of thousands of dollars in winnings live as well. He's incredibly good at taking on stacked fields and experienced opponents, and he's won the 1K Monday tournament on full tilt and multiple $100 rebuy tournaments on PokerStars. When he gets to a final table, you can usually count on him to seal the deal. In addition to his poker success, Aditya is currently finishing up a business administration degree at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Aditya is on the phone with us today to talk about poker strategy and about what's helped him along the path to success. All right, so how are you doing, Aditya? I'm doing good. Uh, thanks for having me, Sean. Oh, no, thank you for appearing on the show. So, uh, no problem. So how did you get started in poker initially? Well, I started off playing poker four years ago during my freshman year at college after some of my friends got me into it. And then I saw the World Series of Poker on TV, and I was completely hooked. <laughs> well, I mean, and like what steps did you use to get started? Like how did you start, what stakes did you play, and how did you move up? Well, in the dorms, we used to play a 10-cent, 20-cent cash game with a $5 buy-in and a $2 re- rebuy. And it was actually one of my friends in there, like he used to play online, and he introduced me to online poker. And uh, he, o- he helped me open an account in Poker Room, and that's where I got started playing online. And I slowly branched out to other sites. Okay, and just talking about online poker, you are currently being mentored by Sorel Mitzi, and you've been mentored by him for a while. And he is obviously considered to be one of the best online poker players out there. How did you come to be mentored by him? Well, uh, Sorel and me used to play together on uh, Paradise Poker a lot, and we were both rebuy maniacs, and we <laughs> would like gamble with each other a lot during the rebuy period in the 100 rebuy tournaments. Uh, once Paradise closed down, I was able to get this IM from a common friend, and then we started like talking a lot and discussing a lot of hands and everything. And eventually, we met each other at the World Series this uh, last year, and that's when he officially started mentoring me right after the World Series. Okay. And what does mentoring really mean? I mean, you hear about players being mentored all the time, but what does that actually entail? Well, the way Sorel does it with me is, like, I have access to all his hand histories. Okay. And then he goes over my hand histories and he says, all right, this is this is something you shouldn't do. And, you know, like, if he's on a final table, like, uh, he'll hit me up on IM and let me, like, he'll tell me his whole cards and his thought process. So, I mean, he does a lot of hard work. I think, like, he really, like, is mentoring me, you know, then just, mm-hmm. you know, for the sake of, sake of just saying mentoring me. He's actually working very hard. Okay. And um, this may be out of line, so tell me if it is, but, I mean, what does Sorel get out of that, aside from the satisfaction of helping an up-and-comer? Uh, well, we do have a financial deal with this. I'm not sure if I want to, like, uh, say it, because I don't know if I'm at liberty to say it. But I think it's really beneficial to both of us, and I, I think I'm getting the better deal out of it. Okay. <laughs> well, of course you are, because you're you're getting tutored by one of the best out there right now. Without without a doubt, yes. Um, well, you said that you met him playing the same rebuy tournaments as him. I mean, were these high stakes rebuy tournaments or? Uh, I, like I used to only play at Paradise Poker, and these were the biggest rebuys back in the day. It was like around a uh, year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. Okay. So these were like the hundred rebuys. Yes. Okay, so you had, so you were already playing hundred dollar rebuy tournaments before you started being mentored by him. Yeah, but I used to only win on Paradise Poker and nowhere else. So okay, yes. Well, has there been anything pretty unconventional that he's taught you? Oh well, almost everything he has taught me has been unconventional. <laughs> like he taught me a whole new way of playing things like I've never thought of before. But I'm not allowed to share those things. But it's really a fun style to play, and it's like very very effective. Well, you say things that you had never heard about before, like things that are still not really out there, things that the general public still has not even heard about, plays that you've never seen. Yeah, like the general public just frowns on those plays, which uh, sort of has taught me, you know, like, um, I don't want to really say any of those plays, but (laughs) like many people would think like it's just garbage, but, you know, it's actually very, very effective, you know. Okay. Well... Obviously, the hottest topic concerning Sorel right now is still the situation with um, Full Tilt, wherein he took over another player's account to finish off a tournament. What are your thoughts on that whole thing? 
Well, when the whole situation came out, he was just shattered. Like there was like so much hatred thrown towards him, and he now realizes how big deal this is. Like, but when he did it, he didn't. And this in- incident hasn't changed my opinion on him at all. I feel the p- poker community should understand that he went through a lot, and he has realized his mistake. And everyone deserves a second second chance. So maybe they should lighten up a bit on him. Right. Well. Regarding the specific issue of, like he he wasn't multi accounting in the tournament. Just to clarify, he was already busted out of the tournament, and another player who was deep in the tournament um, offered a financial situation wherein he would take over the play of that player's account to finish off the tournament. Do you have yeah. any specific qualms with that method? I mean, or do you think that maybe the issue is overblown a bit? Well. Still, very recently, I believe like most of the sites actually legally allowed this, but uh, like since then, like it's obviously wrong, and uh, the sites realized it. So I mean, it's kind of in a little bit of a gray idea because it's kind of like hosting, which is like which which obviously can't be regulated. But uh, I think like if a person actually logs in and plays for another person, it's wrong. So okay, I mean, well. What tools do you use to improve your game aside from being mentored by one of the world's best players? Well, besides discussing hands and situations and reviewing hand histories, I really don't think I use any more tools. Like, I'll, I browse Pocketfives and 2 plus 2 forums a lot mm-hmm. to see if there are, like, any interesting hands or situations which come up and what the other good players are thinking about it. But besides that, I don't use any tools. But I always talk a lot of poker with my other friends, too, and it's just a continuous poker discussion which keeps me sharp. Okay. Well, you recently took second in the PokerStar Super Tuesday tournament, which is a $1,000 buy-in tournament that usually has a lot of really excellent players in it. Now, let's be honest, though. How much of that field is comprised of players that you would actually consider excellent? Well, besides having excellent winners, these tournaments have a lot of satellite winners. And these satellite winners is what makes this tournament so much fun. Like, you'll always find people stalling at the 1K bubble, but never at a 100 rebuy bubble. <laughs> and that's what makes these players so exploitable. Uh, whom I would consider excellent? Well, I wouldn't consider many players like were regulars to be excellent. I, con- I consider most regulars to be decent to good, and I consider myself to be in that category. But the people who I consider excellent are just Sorel, Mello, Annette, and Scott. So. Okay. Well, and you say you consider yourself to be kind of a, a good to decent player. What do you think you still need to do to rise to the level of being an excellent player? Well, Sorel says that we are at 20%, so <laughs> once I reach 100%, I guess I'll be much better. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I mean, are there any specific leaks in your game right now that you know of? or? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like... Um... Um, I feel like I spew a lot sometimes. Like I feel like people are playing back at me, and I'll just overshove ace jack or like a small pocket pair, just thinking like we are just playing back, and they'll fold. And I usually run into big hands, but I'm definitely getting better with that. You know, I means I, I like I like I'm better at holding my chips than I was before. Okay. Well, I've heard someone say that when bad players play bad players or good players play good players, luck predominates, and that skill only comes into play when good players are playing bad players. What are your thoughts on that philosophy? I disagree. Like, uh, Take the 1K, for example. There's a chance that you can be on a table with four or five regulars. When I say regulars, I'm referring to players like who play a lot of volume and usually play the 100 rebuy on a fairly regular basis. Mm-hmm. And when you're playing with such players, you already have a history with them because, like, I probably have played with every play, every regular in the 100 rebuy, like, at least 40 times, you know. So it just becomes a mind game, and it's just who thinks at a higher level and outplays the other. Okay. Well, I mean, but don't you think that once it gets to that point where it's like you have to kind of determine what level that player's thinking on, and it kind of goes back and, well, he's thinking, he knows that I know this, and I know that he knows that I know... And it's, at just, that point, it's just like a mind game. You, you just have to like outthink the other. I mean, if you have history with them, you, you, you can kind of think like, all right, he puts me on his jack, you know? So that's why he's making this play, and he'll probably think that I'll fold my ace jack or ace queen or whatever you have. And you can just like, if you can if you can think what he's thinking that you have, you can like outthink him and like play your hand, you know? Okay. Well... I think a lot of people have trouble determining 
when and how to bluff, especially things like when to fire a second shot or when to even fire a third shot. Can you kind of give me some advice on this and maybe some situations when firing the second or third shot are poor decisions? Yes, uh, I think stack sizes are very important on with your read on the person. If you feel the guys are calling station, there's no point in trying to bet scare cards because you're never going to be, you, like, you're always going to be called light. Like, I've seen people try and bluff perfect scare cards into calling station, and it never works. <laughs> so I usually shut down if I know, like, the person is known to be calling light. Okay. Uh, I feel another time not to two-barrel, three-barrel is when the stacks are too shallow. Because, like, if, a, if if your opponent calls a big bet on the flop and doesn't have much left, you know, there's absolutely no point in trying to bluff skate cards because he's not going to flat there with a draw. You know, means he's, he's usually just going to shove his draws, you know. Mm -hmm. So, it means he's, he, he probably has a big hand and he's not getting away from it. So, it means whatever skate card comes, there's, like, no point bluffing into them. Okay. So, it, it's very important to get the stack size. Well, there's also the case of... Even if it is a relatively dry board and a scare card comes on the turn or the river, you, you would also have to consider whether or not the person you're playing against is thinking on the level that they know you're just betting a scare card. So how do you take that into account? Yeah, like uh, like usually good players know, like, you know, like let's say the flop came 10 high and you made, like you raised three flop and then you continue bet and the turn is an ace and you bet big. Usually good players know, like, you know, that you're trying to represent an ace there, and they'll probably call, call you down with, like, maybe even a 10. So usually it's not a good idea to, like, you know, bet into good players, like, bet skate cards into good players. But against bad players, it's very easy to just represent, try and represent an ace there, and they usually just fold. Okay. Well, this is kind of a broad question, but have you played any particularly interesting hands lately? Actually, yes. Uh, there was this interesting situation that came up in the Super Tuesday a few weeks ago. Uh, there was this hand on the bubble, which I remember very clearly. Uh, we were exactly on the bubble, and I had been playing my standard aggressive game. And the baddest check, who's, like, who's also a very good player, was to my left. And Ruthless, who's an uh, amazing player, was to his left. And Ruthless had 20 big blinds. The baddest check and me had around 30 big blinds. And we were exactly on the bubble. The hand before, I had raised the baddest check's big blind from the small blind. And yet, instead, he raised me in the big blind, and I shoved and he folded. Hmm. Uh, the reason I shoved was that I was I knew that he was going to re-raise me light because we were on the bubble and he and we had the same stack. And he knows that I'm almost never flatting him out of position, so he can just get away by making a small raise there on the bubble and forcing me to either shove, shove on the bubble or fold. So having played with him and having history with him. Uh, just made an easy, just made my decision easy to just shove almost any two there against him. Like I would literally shove any two because I know he's not calling. The very next hand, I was dealt ace queen on the button, and I raised the button, and the baddest check just went all in from the small blind, which was like a huge overshove. <laughs> and ruthless behind him tanked and finally called. Now, like while ruthless was tanking, I had decided that I was gonna snap call the baddest check. Mainly because I felt that he would have ace jack, ace ten, and maybe weaker aces a lot of times there. So I usually have him drawing to three out a lot of times. Um, they they would be like small pocket pays in his range too because he would usually just shove those instead of raising raising those because he knows that if I shove, he probably has to call off with a small pair, which is usually not that good as shoving. Right. Uh, but when ruthless called, I knew like you know ruthless is a really good player and he was well aware of what was going on. But even having all that information, I was pretty confident, like, Dootle was never calling off his stack with a low pocket pair there. I felt that his most likely holding was, like, the same hand as me. And I now felt that the baddest chick probably had a small pair. Because, like, if I have an ace and Dootle has an ace, it's, you know, very unlikely that the baddest chick has an ace. So based on all this information, I just folded that hand, which was which would have been a huge part because Dootle was short stack, so... Even if I won the side pot, I would have actually had the same stack effectively. So, but based on all the information, I just folded, and the baddest chick showed eight eight, and Rufus showed ace jack. <laughs> so, and the baddest chick held. I don't know if the results matter, but okay. Well, on your blog, you said that you'd prefer to play two tables at once while watching a movie then play nine tables. Now, either way, I'd say that it would be pretty hard to focus. Just how important is focusing, really, when you're not playing a hand? Well, I haven't updated my blog in a long time, and since then <laughs> I've changed my opinion on this. 
I think focusing is really, really important. And like as people start playing live, they do realize this because if you see live players, they are like well aware of the importance of observing everything going on on the table more than online players. Basically, mainly because online players play more tables, you know. Right. So, but once you start focusing, you will see like so many more spots which you would have missed if you weren't paying attention. That you can like really use those spots to chip up a lot. Uh, like me myself, like I've seen like so 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 much better results recently playing fewer tables and focusing. And I know many good players like who multi table always check hand history immediately after a big hand to you know if they miss an action on any street just so they have all the information which is being given to them. I think it's very important to get as much information about your opponents as you can. So I would say like focusing is really really important. Even if you're not in the hand, you should be like paying attention like who's playing how on like every street. Okay. Well, how many tables do you play at once now then? Uh not more than four or five, except on Sundays. Okay. Well, the last question I have for you is that uh, you call yourself a good closer. So, what exactly does that mean, and how do you do it? Well, I feel like when I make a final table, the play usually tightens up a lot, and many people just play to move up in the money ladder while I'm playing to win. So, I, I play my aggro style usually, and that helps me to get top three. Since many people will just stay out of your way, out of your way, and they will just avoid confrontations. And you can easily chip up if you have like somewhat of an average stack at a final table. So, like I, I never get worried if I come with a short stack or an average stack on a final table because like just so easy to like just run over people and chip up on final tables. Okay, sounds great. Well, I really appreciate you getting on the phone and doing this interview with us, man. Thanks for having me, Sean. Not a, not a problem. And thank you guys for watching the online zone on Card Player TV.